Okay, so I'm from Boston Place Clinic. We're a clinic in London. We've been open for about two years, and coming up to three years almost. Um, we're the newest in this uh, group of clinics in the UK, the Fertility Partnership. There's a few of us around here. As I've seen these members from Oxford here, members from Hammersmith. Um, we do just over 6,000 cycles a year, so currently the largest group of clinics in the UK. And I'm going to start with a, with a question. Um, Amy, as an Embryoscope user, would you say that dish is half full or half empty? <laughs> <laughs> What's your technical uh, opinion on the matter? If they're the only two answers, half full. Half full. Are you optimist? <laughs> Always. So the thing with quality control is we all want to be optimistic. Um, and that's how I've been told to grow up and see life. But when it comes to quality control, you can't turn around and say, yeah, I know that incubator's at 35 degrees. I'm sure it'll get better, yeah? Um, you, you kind of have to be a pessimist. And you need to be a glass half empty type of girl. So wrong answer. Um, <laughs> And I, I kind of want to get you to the frame of mind. You know those crazy people who have the signs, the end is near. Okay, so that's the kind of point I want to get you to. The fact non-conformities are going to happen. So sort of accept it, no matter how many um, things, pre many preventative mechanisms you put in place. Something's going to go wrong at some point. And the idea is put things in place that is going to allow you to identify these non-conformities. And you want to do this as early as possible, particularly if you're a small clinic, which makes it extra challenging. And you want to minimize the impact before it gets to the point where it affects your patients. So we had a really nice talk from Yakov. So we looked at temperature, CO2, VOC, particle count, all your daily checks of the lab. And then you've got the FERT rates, blast rates, so a little bit later along, already starting to affect your results, but at least you're picking it up earlier before it affects your pregnancy rates, your miscarriage rates. Um, you don't really want it to be getting that far. So what do we do? We constantly check our kit. So the embryoscopes have, I don't know how many sensors, what's the official number of sensors inside there, but we still don't trust it. We still tag along an extra one on the outside, measure the CO2 independently, measure the pH independently, measure the, and we do this on a daily basis. <coughs> it, it hasn't flawed in those parameters in two years, but we still do it on a daily basis to check what's going on. And that's because as embryologists, we have serious trust issues. So be pessimistic, have trust issues. This is not a TED talk, okay? So I'm gonna go a little bit into continuous versus discrete data to try and set the tone of where I'm trying to fit the time lapse in here. Now, talking about mathematics to embryologists, to biologists, it's kind of like talking about shoes to your husband. Um, but I'm going to try and use kind of like the blastocysts um, as an example to try and explain where, where I'm trying to get to. So you have continuous data on one side of the slide. You have binary outcome or discrete data on the other side. So with binary outcome, you either have it or you don't. You're going to do your day five checks for blastocysts. At that particular point, it's either a blastocyst or it isn't. But it could be that it formed a blastocyst an hour later, and we're going to classify that as a day six blastocyst but it's only an hour away from the points that you checked. And this is where the continuous data is so much better because it doesn't just tell you that it's a day five or day six embryo. It tells you, well, it's day five plus one hour, plus three hours, plus 10 hours. So you have here the example, the second example is when a blast is going through collapsing process. So you check that embryo, and at that particular point in time, it looked like that, but in fact, it was a blastocyst already. So when you're measuring your blastulation rates, and you're comparing a clinic that uses time-lapse and one that doesn't, you might actually see that the one that uses time-lapse has higher blastulation rates. Not because they're so amazing. Um, it's probably because they're more accurate at picking out their blastocysts. So from the continuous side, you're going to have a reduced error rate you can have increased understanding of the accuracy of the variability in your data, and you can have an increased sensitivity of detecting what's going, what's going on uh, with the parameters you're measuring. Um, 
An example of where you can actually introduce bias just by when you're deciding on to check your embryos would be, let's say you look at one clinic and this clinic has really good blast rates or blastocyst expansion if you're looking at good quality and clinic B, uh, not so well. Um, so you go, ah, it's because of the media they're using. When in fact, one does the embryo transfers at 8 a.m. and checks their embryos then, one does the embryo transfers at 2 p.m. And therefore, there's more time for these embryos to get onto the becoming good quality expanded blastocysts. So this introduction of bias is a much bigger problem with discrete data, with binary data, than it is with the continuous. So with the continuous, you can have a more power because with increased sensitivity, you get more power. You, you get to trust your data a bit more. And with the binary outcome, you might actually, with your wrong information, lead on to the wrong conclusions. So, a few more benefits. So if you're using the continuous data, because of your increased power, it means you need a smaller number of patients or embryos to detect a problem, to detect an issue. And a smaller sample size, it means that you can actually look further in terms of, okay, we're not quite hitting target, how far are we from the target? And you might even be able to try and dissect your data further to see what is causing these issues. So always choose continuous data instead of discrete data. And this is a mathematical certainty. This is not my opinion, this is just fact. Has this been done with morphokinetics? So this is my favorite paper of all time. I think it's been done really neatly. Um, it's Dean Morbeck's lab, and where he looked at using morphokinetics to detect quality of oil uh, using mouse embryos. And he kind of exposed different concentrations of Q in hydroperoxide. So this is a VOC that's naturally occurring, uh, that accumulates in oil. And he looked at Tritonex, which is a detergent uh, which is commonly found in oil, uh, which is used for the washing of the oil. And what he found is that looking at the blastocyst rates, so that's the, the graphs on the left, um, and you have the various concentrations on the, on the tabs here on, on the side. There you go, there and there. So using blastocyst rates, it really took a while to detect um, so only at eight mi micromolar, whilst the time to blastulation was a little bit sooner, and down here a lot sooner. So the sensitivity of this safe, ooh, if you're using time lapse, is much greater. And when he was incorporating CC2s, T5s, and looking at a few more parameters, he saw significantly, so down to two micromolar concentration, which is very low. And he took it to an extra step. So he took two lots of oil that had passed quality control uh, using mouse embryo uh, assays, and then were used for human uh, embryos and were recalled because of poor uh, statistics coming back from them. And those two lots, he then used his modeling to try and see if he could uh, detect, and he actually could quite sensitively detect the issues with the two lots when blastulation rates were unaffected. So this has already been shown, this is not my idea, but it kind of led me on an inspiration for the lab. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a few examples because we like to change things in the lab, not because change for the sake of change, but it's because you wanna be continuously improving, but you're always a little bit like that whenever you change anything in the lab. So we monitor it, we do sibling studies constantly for every change we introduce. Um, so here's an example where we had an Integra 3 and an I3. We were one of the first clinics in the world to have the Integra 3, which meant that we had, to, um, we had nobody to ask for references. So we just did a sibling analysis with two practitioners, switching the practitioners, switching the kit, and it was a balanced uh, two-way uh, assessment. Um, no significant differences from fertilization, degeneration, 3PN, all our traditional KPIs, absolutely no issues. But we did detect issues with some of our morphokinetics. Another example, an IVF. I like this video because you actually can see the sperm that's about to get into that egg. Um, 
we looked at shortening our IVF period, so shortening the co-incubation of the eggs and the sperm together. Um, from Instead of doing overnight, we started doing it between two and six hours. So that the eggs can then go back into the embryoscope incubator on day zero, not on day one, which means you can collect more morphokinetic parameters, which are quite critical for some of our, our models. And um, essentially, the numbers were quite low, only 46. Um, and although this looks quite high, um, over extensive periods of data that were not sibling, we, we saw that it was just normal fertilization methods, but it was not significant across these numbers. But we already had enough numbers to see. So this is, we got along the top here, the various morphokinetic uh, parameters, uh, the absolute time points, and the in-between time points. And the ones which are in green, we kind of detected significant differences. So even with relatively low numbers, you can already start to see, and these make sense. So the IVF ones compared, uh, had issues early, early on uh, in terms of the timings, and later on kind of <coughs> narrowed down. And what we found was that the short IVF actually brought it closer to the ICSI time point. It was kind of an in-between the, the normal IVF or the overnight IVF. So that was one example. Here's another one, media. Um, we compared media one with media two, so we are big believers of single step media. We had two single step products, and we looked at the fertilization, and you can see here that we, we had 649 embryos in each arm. This is sibling study. This was actually blinded to the uh, practitioners because we didn't want any bias. You always give a bias to the uh, media you're already using. Um, so we removed that by making it blind. And you can see that the FERT rates, 2PN, blastulation rates were all fairly consistent all the way through. But we did see variation in the speed at which these embryos reached the blastocyst stage. And this variation continued and it actually increased to the later blastocyst steps. Um, and making sense, the TSB minus TPNF also was affected as was the S2. So we would have thought that uh, change the media, you, you'll be fine, there are no issues. And we did enough numbers to bring that conclusion. Uh, I'm not saying that one media is better than the other, but you do kind of need to rethink if you're using your models to select embryos, you need to be aware that this is going to happen. Embryo selection, so uh, another example. So embryo selection without time lapse, I don't know if Alison remembers this is from a poster a long time ago, but back, back before time lapse and going, should we do an early cleavage check? Um, and found that implantation rates were actually higher um, in the embryos that did cleave earlier. So when we're checking at 25 hours, our very early model, we kind of just had like, let's just get it to do in the early cleavage check for us and had 25 hours as a check. So the first time that we made an evaluation of our model, uh, so this is also part of our quality control system, we kind of took all those embryos where the patient didn't get pregnant in the fresh cycle, but did get pregnant in the frozen cycle, and that gives you a little paired analysis where you have, so it's not only a, um, a t-test, it's a paired t-test that you can do because it's the same patient. And we were able to see from uh, that, in fact, the positives were a little bit further on. So even at this point, we only had like six patients that fit this category. Um, so this is what we were looking at. So you have the kids positives on the top and the kids negatives on the bottom. And this is what we were doing. This is what our model was telling us to do. And the area in the curve of 0 0.5 suggests that it was not predictive at all. So by changing how we were selecting the embryos with just this one parameter, we actually increased the power of our assessment just by delaying a little bit instead of 25 hours, uh, bringing it all the way to 28 and a half. Okay, another example with assisted hatching. So we're looking, there's lots of ways to assisted hatch. Now, some people do triangles, some people do a thin strip, some people do a big strip, some people do a semicircle. And we just wanted to see and use the videos so what you have here, watch this one. This one hatches much easier. It, it, it sort of comes out, whilst the other one's kind of like, this one really struggles to get through the holes. And it's not, this is just example embers where we've seen this consistently. So if you do a small hole, if you do just two little strips, the, 
you, you see this kind of pattern where they keep collapsing in themselves and not coming out of, their, of the shell. Whilst with a bigger hole, and in fact we did a, a, the semicircle seemed to be the one that uh, behaves the best. Um, I don't know, it's just a way that you can monitor how different people do their um, assisted hatching. And the last one is post biopsy survival. So putting the embryos back in the incubator after you've done your biopsy. Um, and what you have here, this is an embryo that survived. And this is an embryo that although the cells still look okay, it never re-expanded. Now, you, you can't really do this assessment without the time lapse. And particularly when you're training staff, you, you can then assess survival based on the time lapse. Um, as opposed to just you know, keep taking it out regularly. So you can actually look at how long does it take for this embryo to re-expand again. Um, we haven't quite built the models for that yet, but it's one of the things that we're working on uh, as to whether that can further enhance the PGS success rates. So the idea is not to replace what you already do with temperatures and fert rates and pregnancy rates, but just supplement it with the morphokinetics. It's an extra tool. It helps you monitor the change. It's about using, because it makes mathematical sense, for one thing, and it's a good tool to monitor your changes, and the principle has been demonstrated um, not just by us, but by other labs as well. So just to end on a really positive note, okay, so I am optimistic that, you know, these systems are going to evolve and they're going to get improved to the point where we can truly trust the changes that we're introducing into the lab. So I have a fantastic team of embryologists and medical students yeah, and I'm happy to take any questions.